Hello, everybody. If you are watching live, it is early on a Friday morning, and we are talking about a deep subject. If you're watching on the archive, uh, my my recommendation for everyone is that because this conversation we're about to have is one that is emotional, uh, for some people it is triggering, that you watch this when you are resourced, when you maybe have a fluffy blanket or someone who loves you to hold your hand, and um, that you kind of know that this subject matter is a little deeper than than some of the other conversations we normally have on a on a Friday morning, but it's important and worth it. And we're specifically having this conversation in the Sierra Pacific Synod because the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has several messages on gender violence and how we want to untangle ourselves from ways that we participate in gender violence. So today we will be talking about the movie Pray Away, which touches on themes of ways that LGBTQ folk have been harmed, ways that they have harmed themselves sometimes, ways that they have harmed others sometimes, and ways that um, using some approaches from the psychological community in pastoral care, if we take on the biases of, of psychology, might also lead to biases within our church institutions. So, Take a second and wiggle your toes and remember you're a full-bodied person and let's have a tough but important conversation. All right, after that kind of trigger warning, I'm Bishop Megan Rohr and I identify as transgender. I also identify as a part of the LGBTQ community. I have a wife, I have two kids, one of which is black and transgender. So I do have a stake in this conversation, uh, but I'm also a very faithful person who is excited to help those who have yet to be able to imagine LGBTQ folk or trans folk as faithful to expand their imagination. One of the ways that we can expand our imagination is through arts, through movies, through documenta documentaries. Um, and so I'm excited today to have this conversation about an important documentary, Pray Away. In the comments below is a link to where you can watch the film and more information about it. But I have a special guest with me. Um, would you be willing to introduce yourself, special guest, and tell folk about some of your intersections? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Miles Markham. I use he, him, or they, them pronouns. I identify as queer and transmasculine, non-binary. I am Native Hawaiian, Japanese American. I am a graduate of Columbia Theological Seminary, and I was both a consulting producer for Pray Away, and now I serve as what they call the film's impact producer. And Pray Away is about the subject of conversion therapy, something that in a lot of states is now considered abuse and is, is against the law. However, um, in a lot of places, laws helped kind of develop this kind of therapy uh, process into being. Can you explain for folk who might not be familiar with conversion therapy, what it is, what its hopes were, and, and then maybe um, some of the harms that, that people have experienced through it? Sure. Um, well, uh, conversion therapy, uh, which I'll also add has at different times been called reparative therapy. It's also been called reintegrative therapy, and it's also known by any number um, of other more coded phrases. Um, it's, it's not just a set of practices, it's an ideology. And um, as folks will see in the film, it, it's also a movement. It encompasses all the ways that people attempt to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. And this is usually led by either a licensed counselor, a religious leader, or um, can be a part of a peer support group situation. I think that the hope or the goal of conversion therapy is kind of a moving target. And uh, if folks start to look into this more, they'll see that some groups earnestly believe that they should and can go from being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer into becoming cisgender, heterosexual, 
and culturally normative uh, in, in both of those identities. Um, there are, however, other people um, where the goal or the hope is a little more amorphous um, and they aren't necessarily seeking to become heterosexual or cisgender, but uh, they are decidedly leaving behind the LGBTQ lifestyle, which uh, looks different for everyone who claims that sort of thing for themselves. And, um, and, and it, as far as the harm goes, um, in the film, at least, uh, you see uh, a number of people uh, telling stories of their own and the stories of other people uh, who this leads to depression, anxiety, self-harm, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide ideation, and attempt. Um, what the film doesn't quite tell, though, is about the panic, mood, sleeping, eating, and autoimmune disorders that are prevalent among survivors. It, it doesn't fully tell the way that these practices lend themselves to substance abuse and addiction, to chronic homelessness, how they set people up to accept intimate partner violence. And it doesn't outright state that no matter how long you are exposed or expose yourself to these kinds of beliefs and practices, it truly, um, you know, from my own personal experience, I'll, I'll speak, uh, soaks itself uh, into your bones and your soul and uh, sets you up to spend the rest of your life trying to release that pain and, and hopefully be able to find a way to heal. Well, and, and you kind of mentioned that you have your own kind of personal experience with, with conversion therapy. We, we, we spoke earlier and you gave me permission to kind of ask you questions about that. Um, before, before I do that, though, I want to just name for folk who might not have an LGBTQ experience that sometimes conversion therapy comes as like a, a program or a process. And other times it comes out in language in ways that people have heard other people say, um, but didn't know was connected to kind of this idea that LGBTQ folk um, should change or as as it said really dramatically in some faith traditions, turn or burn um, is the way that some people would say it. But it comes out in phrases that seem benign, like if someone says, I am LGBTQ or I am trans, to ask the follow-up question, are you sure? And how do you know? Um, and these questions are, are normal questions that people might just not know how you know or how you discern this or how you figure it out. And when it comes to someone's call to be a pastor, it's completely fine to say, how do you know you're called to be a pastor? And so people might think that being LGBTQ is similar to other callings that people have and ask follow-up questions like that. It becomes triggering though, because when people say some of the really tough rhetoric, kind of the, the, the kinder rhetoric, but that still has a string back to conversion therapy, yanks on those wounds and those gabs that we have and kind of pulls them apart. Um, would you be willing to speak about some of your own experiences with, with conversion therapy and what, what that's meant in your lived experience? Yeah, sure. Um, and again, I, I really appreciate you offering that caveat because I do think that um, curiosity is actually a part of how we heal the world, of being curious about other people's experiences. And yet um, the language that comes with that question that you mentioned, you know, how do you know, and are you sure? Um, for many of us, you know, it is rooted, you know, in the idea that there is something not quite right, you know, about our uh, identities. So. Um, I, I do think that that is important to note. Um, as far as my own experiences go, um, I, I guess it's <laughs> worthwhile to mention I grew up in uh, the Southeast and I grew up in um, majority conservative um, politically and religiously types of communities. 
And there are lots of good things that came with that and lots of harmful things that also uh, were a part of that experience. I am, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a uh, multi-ethnic, multiracial person. That is also true of the rest of my family. And I think that my earliest sort of um, childhood memories are related to feeling different. And as a child, I could not really parse out what of that uh, was connected to my different lineages and what was connected to how I was experiencing um, transness or queerness as a little kid. And yet, um, because of um, the the neighborhoods, the schools, and the churches I was going to, I couldn't help but feel like something was wrong uh, with with who I was and and how I was made. And I think as a young person and even as an adult, if you don't have any other way of thinking about yourself, um, you have no other way of being able to learn, you know, that there is a viable future for you ahead. Uh, and, and so I desperately wanted um, to like fix this thing about me. And while my parents' uh, expression of Christian faith was somewhat more um, open and nurturing, I gravitated toward ex expressions of Christianity that were much more um, narrow and uh, exclusionary, unfortunately, and offered a clear prescription uh, to what I thought was a problem. And so that is how I was introduced to uh, X LGBTQ thinking and ministry. I, you know, was a teenager at the time, and so I was participating um, in part online with uh, different X LGBTQ ministry uh, through online forums. Uh, but then I was also just independent of that, pursuing um, my own reading and reaching out to different pastors and uh, different you know, Christian educators on the topic and pursuing sort of like an informal um, type of support to not be queer, to not be trans. And I continued on that trajectory through college. I would say that my most um, pointed um, experience with this kind of thinking and these beliefs and practices were in the context of my church. I was a part of a 12-step program, which was based on Celebrate Recovery, which is based on Alcoholics Anonymous. And it is this idea that you can come to this space with A to Z life issues and seek to recover, you know, from whatever it is that brought you in the door. And so you literally work through the 12 steps um, and you're taught, um, in my case, to see same-sex attraction and gender confusion um, as something that, you know, God seeks to heal and is uh, the, the way that the gospel can unfold in a person's life is uh, to offer them a way um, to, at the very least, manage these disordered things in their life. So, uh, yeah, that's where I was receiving, I think, the most clear and firm messages about uh, who I was and how I loved and related to the world as sinful and broken and is sort of the the site in, in that way of um, some of the greatest trauma I, I endured. Thank you for sharing that because I know that sometimes sharing kind of the the personal wounds can dredge them back up and so I just I'm appreciative of you sharing some of that. I, I was thinking as you were sharing your story about one of the, how the complexity is that we do know that scripture can change lives, right? We do know that God does have a path, um, or or if you look into the Greek, it's the same word for the is a, mm. and so instead of it being a single path, 
it can be many paths and paths that we try to forge on our own. And so there are texts that say we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And then there are other texts that say, kind of get in line with this new Christian way of life because being a Christian, being a Christian transforms you. And what is hard is that it seems like each generation has a group of identities that, that even if they know God loves you no matter what, you can't shake it off. They want that group of people who usually doesn't have enough votes to get a majority vote to have their full place in a faith space to prove it that God loves mm -hmm. them. And so each generation relearns and restudies a particular type of folk um, to see if they should change who they are or if God can love them. And trying to figure out in our nuance how we can talk about how people change and that change is possible um is complicated and and needs to be done kind of in an intersectional lens and for me as a trans person i really value self-identification and so what i've been struggling with with language um kind of throughout the film is that and and what i think is wonderful about the film is that it lifts up people in different points of time in their life where they believe really radically opposite things and they believe that the way to be their truest, most faithful self is different. And what I appreciate about that is that it shows that, that people change. Uh, but the difficulty with that is that it makes it hard. If, if I believe that conversion therapy is incredibly harmful, but I also deeply believe that people get to self-identify, that when people are expressing to me that they believe conversion therapy is a gift from God. It's complicated, right? And it's hard to talk about. Part of, so I don't have the answer to that. I'm just naming that it's hard and it's complicated. And um, I, I love the idea that people can change that we, and that we can celebrate that. Like a documentary can do that over a person's life and celebrate that. Um, but the part that I think is, really worth lifting up that as a as a bishop as someone who's a part of a candidacy process in the lutheran church and i think also in the presbyterian church which which you've been a part of is the very first step in seeing if someone can be a pastor involves a psychological evaluation and what that has meant is that when psychological communities have had biases or considered certain groups or certain cultures disordered that there have been gatekeepers into who can become pastors based on kind of these psychological background checks. And in the 60s and 70s, how pastoral care happened in church communities was radically changed when church, church leaders and seminaries kind of adopted this idea of, let's make pastoral care more like the best practices of therapy or like counseling. And, I, and the film sort of starts in this realm of talking about the biases that existed in culture, like, it was against the law to be LGBTQ. It was against um, psychological ideas of what was a disorder uh, to be LGBTQ. And then, so of course, it was against the laws of church to be LGBTQ. And, and it being a part of a kind of a biased way of thinking that sort of gets passed on. And so I'm just curious if you have thoughts because you work, you've, you've been to seminary, you, you work in the church world, if you have thoughts about some of the ways that we inherit biases from the therapeutic community sometimes, and hopefully they shake them off, like being lesbian, gay, and bisexual is no longer disordered, but trans is still on the list. Um, and that probably will change over time. But do you have any ideas about how faithful people and faithful institutions can try to untangle themselves from biases that might have come from, if if we look way back, a lot of these models of how to care for LGBTQ people happened because they only studied people in prison. And so they believed all LGBTQ people were criminals because they only studied ones in prison or they only studied folk in severe mental health hospitals. And so their results about what happens if you're LGBTQ were only about people ending up in mental health hospitals. There, there weren't studies on healthy people, only studies on disordered people. So they found that those people were disordered. And so if any thoughts you have about how we as people of faith, as congregations can untangle ourselves from some of these biases we've inherited from 
the therapy community, I, I would love to hear any thoughts that you have, because it's something I'm deeply thinking about, trying to figure out how we move forward, at least as ours centered. Yeah, uh, <laughs> big questions. Um, <laughs> I think my first response is just, oh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I could go in a lot of different directions here. And, and yeah, my gut is to say that the way that we begin to interrogate our own prejudices on this topic is the same way that we would interrogate our prejudices on any topic. I think it's so valuable um, just to grow in self-awareness and knowing kind of what you're having your own reaction to and to be able to ask oneself, um, okay, what am I feeling? Where can I imagine that that is coming from? Um, and are there other stories or other perspectives that might um, at the very least complexify, you know, how I am thinking about this topic. And I, I, I spent a lot of time um, with, you know, the Pray Away team doing research on the uh, X LGBTQ movement as it publicly, you know, has presented itself. And um, I, I will say our research was limited to uh, the United States, um, and yet uh, we found ourselves um, kind of going into some of the archives around the history of studying gender and sexuality, which is connected to the development of um, the modern psychological uh, movement, which has roots, uh, of course, in Austria and Germany. And um, between the US, Austria, Germany, and maybe just um, Western the Western world at large, uh, you and the audience probably know that uh, that perspective um, in as far as whiteness in particular has informed that has tended to um, medicalize difference um, across any number of intersections. And when something is I, I think understood through medical terms that can lend itself to um, something is wrong here. Like, oh, it's different, therefore it is wrong. And um, you, I think actually do get to hear this in the film, but the reason the kind of uh, religious movement happened around ex LGBTQ thinking was in part a, a reaction to um, the DSM depathologizing uh, homosexuality specifically. And a part of the reason that was able to happen was because uh, there were psychologists working in the field to examine their prejudices and, and the bias that they had. And so I am not a person who thinks that we need to distrust, of course, like the psychological and psychiatric community. In fact, I, I do think that there are a number of ways um, in which thinking about uh, how we live and how we think and how we have our being in the world benefit um, from those insights. And yet, just like any other field, um, we're always bringing, you know, our own perspectives and our own uh, point of view uh, to whatever research you know we're doing, and so yeah, I, I think my general encouragement um, is always uh, for people just to pay attention um, to how they're thinking about any given topic, and even if you feel sure that you believe the right thing or the best thing or the most true thing, um, that you're at the very at the very least open you know, to hearing different perspectives. Um, and and it, it just makes me think about um, what you lifted up earlier around this idea of conversion. And I, I've spent a lot of time listening to these stories that people who describe themselves as ex-LGBTQ say um, about who they are and how they've come, you know, to this conclusion about themselves and, you know, something you'll notice um, very frequently in sort of like the story arc is a, a description of, of trauma, you know, or, or abuse or um, 
neglect, you know, something like that. And, and we know for many years that a part of what fueled anti-LGBTQ sentiment was this idea that that's the origin of gender and sexuality diversity, is that something happened to you to make you this way. And, and yet, um, we know now that that's not true. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, it, it, I'm thinking so many other things, but I'll, I'll just say for now that when it comes to the relationship uh, between pastoral care and therapeutic intervention, that um, it is incredibly valuable um, to just take on a, a kind of growth mindset and an openness uh, to hearing ways in which your own perspective might be limited. Yeah, and even, even when it's about um, ways that you personally need to grow, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's kind of the, so often kind of the mantra of like, how to decrease bias is like, well, we'll just get the feedback of people most affected by this. Well, you, I think I think this film uh, shows that there's a, a large diversity of feedback amongst amongst communities, and some people are uh, have exact opposite feelings about what ought to happen next. And and what what I think was interesting for me in a in a different way that was lifted up. In, in Pray Away that, that I haven't seen lifted up in other films that are trying to explain to folk um, the harm that has happened kind of to the LGBTQ community is kind of the clear way the narrative talked about how this harms not only LGBTQ folk, but also their parents and their families because the therapeutic idea, which probably stems back to Freud, um, was that if someone is LGBTQ, they are disordered because something happened to them in their childhood. And if you can repair what happened in that childhood moment, then they won't have these feelings or these ideas anymore, which is um, a lovely idea. I'm a fan of like looking at family systems and at ways that people are harmed and how we can sort out communal harm um, when we don't address these things. And um, when you take someone's identity or what they express as a gift from God and you tell them it's because they were harmed, it can be a very frustrating process, but it also results in uh, family members wondering what they did wrong. And, and PFLAG is a good example of this, parents, friends of lesbians and gays, because there's a whole, there needed to be a whole support network for family and friends to not feel like they had done something wrong or to be able to say something to their children other than, are you sure? And I think you should change. Like, like it's not just the care that needed to happen and the, and the PTSD that happened to the folk who actually went through conversion therapy or the people who heard about it or had microaggressive conversations that included parts of it, but then also their family members because people were essentially saying, if you have a, if you have a queer kid that, you screwed up and it's your fault. And so there is a whole generation of folk who are parents and family members who, who just carried the ache of not knowing if they had done something wrong. And so um, do you have words for, for parents or relatives or friends or, or anyone who you feel like was harmed on the other side of this who maybe hadn't been able to name this or um, is looking for a way to express it to other people why it's been hard for them? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that it's, it's easily overlooked the way that the family is all a part of any, any experience like this and beyond uh, parents, grandparents, you know, and other family members absorbing um, blame, you know, in, in these beliefs and thinking. The other thing that happens is for many LGBTQ people who are living in these experiences, so much of what's being um, 
condemned is not just sexual orientation and gender identity, it's the ways in which we relate to intimacy at large. And so we are consistently being asked to um, shut down or cut off parts of how we relate to ourselves and how we relate to the world. And inevitably, that has a negative impact on all of our relationships. And so something that I, I share with people anecdotally is that if you were to ask my mom, for example, um, what it was like to relate to me while I was in college, she might describe feeling distant from me. She might describe uh, our relationship as um, difficult, um, maybe even antagonizing. And it consistently felt like in our conversations, we were missing each other in one way, shape or form. And I will tell you that that is directly related uh, to what was going on with me at my church and at the Christian college I was attending at the time, that there, there was no way for me to selectively numb um, the parts of myself that I, I thought needed to be shut down in order uh, to love and be devoted to God. And therefore, um, I was living in constant strain um, with her, with friends, uh, with other family members, and that sort of thing. And there's, there's so much repair that has to happen. And so to the parents, the grandparents, all of the, the aunties and uncles, the siblings who are involved in this, and, and friends too, um, I think it's so valuable to consider that um, this is not just a matter of uh, interpersonal dynamics, you know, what's happening between you and another person. There are structural uh, forces kind of at play that inform the way that we think about anything. And so while I believe in personal responsibility and um, taking ownership, you know, of the things that we've said, the things that we've not said, the things that we've done and the things that we've not done, I also think it's so critical um, that we understand uh, the larger s systems that we're a part of. And, and I think that really gives a person the ability to be gracious, you know, um, toward themselves. And, and so that's sort of my advice, you know, for family members in all of this is to be able uh, to view your own experiences and your own development and the things that have come from that um, in a way where you're able um, to to forgive you yourself and, and to understand yourself as never operating autonomously or independently, but as a part of, of larger systems, structures, communities, and ecosystems. That was a very Lutheran way of putting it. Are you sure you're not Lutheran? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, we'll work Who on it. Who can now? Who can now? I was I was noting as you were speaking that I think in in some of the congregations that I've been uh, listening to and speaking with um, since I became bishop, there is there is also I think a group of people for whom they they are Lutheran they have understood kind of these concepts that God loves everyone we we think that everyone's simultaneously a saint and sinner so you don't have to like root out the parts that are bad about people, you just accept that God loves you and try to care for the poor and, and for others in your community. Um, and still we forget, so we come back every Sunday to be reminded. But uh, there are some people who live in areas where they're fine having this kind of internal, internal faith and knowing that LGBTQ folk are loved by God, but the idea of saying it out loud um, and or having to explain it to their neighbors because their neighbors, the way they express their faith, might really deeply ha believe that there is a way that God is categorizing people and helping them to live um, lives that are uh, described by a set of rules that they might not believe in. And and I so I just I see this conversation as being very important for those who are trying to figure out how can I be someone who's not continuing the harm that LGBTQ folk have experienced? Or how can I make it clear that I don't want to participate in that religious narrative that harms LGBTQ folk? And maybe acknowledge that, that there's some harm 
in in not knowing how to like talk to your neighbors about it because some of these ideas are deep in culture and politics and and other things like that uh, i don't think there's an answer i'm just naming that for folk who might be watching this and thinking about their own congregational process and what it might mean uh, that they've been harmed by some of these narratives as well um, but i'm curious because you know I'm a pastor and, and you've acknowledged you've been to seminary and you are a person of, of who has a complicated and changing and evolving relationship with faith. Um, how, how has your faith been impacted during the time you all were making this movie and since it's been released and how, how are you doing? <laughs> Great question. Um, I, I guess maybe I'll start by saying this. Um, our, entire team um, at Multitude Films who produced Pray Away uh, comes from some type of religious connection or background. Um, that, of course, is on a continuum. Some of us have closer connections than others. Um, but something we all shared was that we know firsthand um, that there can be a chasm um, between uh, good intentions and the actual impact of sincerely held beliefs. And I guess I'll just speak for myself and say that a part of how my faith informed my role in this film um, was encouraging me uh, to hold the communities that I've come from to the values uh, and, and standards of God's love and justice. Uh, it encouraged me to tell the truth about what happened um, and is still happening in countless, um, again, well-intentioned faith communities. I don't think anybody is served by denying um, those growth edges in their community. And so my involvement with the film was directly linked to my interest in helping other Christian people recover um, messages that are truly good news um for other people um as well as ourselves so uh that was sort of what led to the film uh, my involvement with it and i think since that point you know as i've continued to do this work uh it's it depends on the day you know and uh how conversations are going interactions that i'm having and i i will note that something i've observed uh, through interactions I've had with friends and family and, and other viewers who are reaching out to us about the film is that um, for many people, they had sort of a vague notion uh, about these kinds of beliefs and practices. They understood that they were out there, but many people thought that they've ended. Many people thought that these were just antiquated um, ways of thinking about uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. And yet, that is re regrettably not true. Um, it is happening everywhere. And we know, for example, that conversion therapy is on every major continent. It looks and sounds different depending on the community that you, know, you are connected to, but it is pervasive uh, and it is not fringe. And so I have only had to go deeper into my own reckoning with um, the, the various Christian traditions uh, that have been recorded over the years. And I will say that it, it makes it hard uh, sometimes, if not frequently, to continue to locate myself uh, with, within Christian identity. Um, but at the same time, uh, I am someone who has found a lot of resonance in more liberative traditions and streams of, of theology and practice. And so in as much as I am ever able, I love uh, to promote those kinds of resources and those kinds of faith communities because they do exist. And for people um, who may sort of be in a spot where they are attempting to untangle these questions and realities around faith, gender, sexuality, race, class, disability, uh, what I love to share with them is that there are rich resources and traditions of people who've also been meaningfully wrestling 
and thinking about these things and on their voices and perspectives have usually just been rendered invisible uh, but they exist they are out there and it's kind of the only way for me to continue to to see myself um a, as a part of uh christian identity and practice yeah sometimes i think because the folk who are the loudest and maybe the most persistent and the most consistently talking about this are folk who with seemingly absolute surety uh, feel like they have it figured out that it is sometimes the most overwhelming narrative even if you know a majority of christians don't believe in these things we're not the loudest we are not the most consistent we're not um as they would say, kind of in the the affirming tradition of of the Canadian Christians, they say it's got to be public, it's got to be um, intentional, and it's got to be explicit, like over and over every time it needs to be said. And that's um, not necessarily the charism of of Lutherans. It's sometimes the charism of Presbyterians, but not very often, right? And so, to be part of faith communities that are ever on that march towards being as welcome as God is, um, trying to be people who are consistently talking about why God can be welcoming and accepting of people as they are in every moment of how they understand themselves, regardless of if they change their mind or if they don't, or um, that, that at least in my understanding of scripture, God changes all the time to make sure changes the methods of trying to remind us that God is with us and for us and loving us. And so um, my hope, my hope is that if, if there is a change that we need to do that, that, that we do it, but that we have a little humility and, and a growth attitude uh, to not always assume we know what other people's work is, right. Or what God is calling that, that group of people to do. I want to name for people that we're about to lift this up to questions from those who are watching because there's a little bit of a delay. I'm telling you this before I ask my my um, my kind of question before I open it up. Um, but lift up lift up questions if you've got them or things that you'd like us to talk about a little bit more. Um, here's the part where I let you have open forum to talk about anything else that you you think is important to share with people. Obviously, like. I mean, have we said it enough? The film is Pray Away. It's on Netflix. You can watch it. The info's in the description. Um, but what what's some of, of the other stuff you want to share before we kind of go into questions from folk who are watching live? Sure. Um, I guess uh, I'd love to share the website with people, uh, prayawayfilm.com, uh, because um, on the website, you'll find our resource page. And the resource page includes um, first and foremost, a mental health guide. And so as uh, Bishop Megan has said, this film is heavy. Um, it broaches a lot of very difficult and for some people triggering topics. We are exploring internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia. We are uh, really uh, exploring how um, those sorts of things get weaponized and therefore um, it lends itself to some of these harmful outcomes we've already mentioned like depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, suicide, ideation, self-harm and so forth. So um, we highly encourage audiences on the front end, in the middle of viewing and the end of viewing to really be thinking um, through what it means to care for yourself um, as, as you're processing this, this kind of film. Um, the second part of that is we have a discussion guide there. And so not only does that discussion guide give you more context about the film, but it also includes a timeline. And so you can kind of understand like where this movement emerged um, in the larger context of um, psychology and politics, um, because both of those are relevant uh, in this discussion. 
And um, in addition to that, you see the uh, the partner organizations that we were uh, working with from the very beginning to come alongside their work to end um, these practices. And so there are LGBTQ um, advocacy resources. There are um, mental health uh, resources, other um, ways to access affordable counseling um, and, and like true therapeutic interventions uh, to help individuals heal. We point to a variety of uh, conversion therapy survivor networks that exist uh, for people who want to uh, be able to enter into a, a peer support situation with other uh, like experienced uh, individuals. And then there's also some general faith and LGBTQ types of resources, um, because we know that that is very important for a lot of people to be able uh, to understand all of their identities um, as uh, integrated. <laughs> and, and so those exist on the website as well. Um, I think the only other resource that I will lift up to that I'd love to point people to is uh, a initiative called the Good Fruit Project. It is something um, that came about as a collaboration between the Trevor Project um, and Q Christian Fellowship. And it is a guide that talks uh, people of faith and Christians in particular uh, through uh, the case for uh, ending conversion therapy and coming out against these kinds of beliefs and practices. And so that is something I also, um, for, for people of faith and Christians in particular, I encourage to explore. It's, it's the Good Fruit Project. Thank you, that's, that's all helpful stuff. Yeah, resources, resources, resources. And um, know that if folk reach out on this subject matter, um, both, both Miles and I will refer you to folk who are experts in the thing that you lift up and um, because we believe particularly because some of these topics involve harm and abuse um, that we want to help you get the most appropriately trained care because this film really is about what happens when people do pastoral care they're not necessarily trained in and so um, just know that if you reach out to us on this particular subject matter um, probably will get a referral because of the nature of what the subject matter is and that and I'm a big fan of that um, referral 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 is the way that that will happen okay we got a, a question from Father Tommy one of my favorite Episcopalians now you have to imagine this in one of the most beautiful southern accents <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll let you you I'll let you imagine that in your head I won't I thank won't. you make make uh tommy feel like i'm i'm uh, making fun or anyway but um so what what was a god moment for you in making this film or moments you can have more than sure god can show up more than once if god wants to yeah i thank you tommy i i think for me one that comes immediately to mind um i i will need to contextualize a little bit and and that is you know to to say that i mentioned feeling for years that I needed to suppress and repress uh, my emotions at large. Uh, what this meant for me in the long term is that feelings um, that I deemed ungodly um, or negative uh, were the first sort of that I tried to eliminate from my life. So um, anger was one of those in particular. And consequently, I have struggled all of my adult life uh, to be able to access anger and to be able to um, hold it and identify it and to be able to express it. And yet I've come to believe that God gives us all of our emotions um, for good reason. And I was able, uh, in actually watching the film, once it was complete, uh, to be able to locate um, what I now understand to be a very kind of holy rage and being able to find that and to release it and to channel it, you know, into passion um, 
was something that I, I would describe as a, a kind of God moment for sure. That's a great way to, to speak about it. And, and you might not want to be identified this way, but you did go to seminary. So I, I think it's, it's maybe related, but there is there. I heard someone say once that the difference between like a regular person who's angry and a pastor who is angry is that a pastor um, uses their anger to make a program or to make a <laughs> that, that faithful people at their best. It's not that we're dismissing our anger and pushing it down, although some people do that. And if that works for you, that's your process. Um, but what I have found um, is that a lot of times, because I do a lot of public speaking, people really want me to live in the angry parts, to live mm. in the harm, to mm -hmm. live in the parts that that um, name only what went wrong, but not the people who helped kind of clear the path or or how the healing happened. And kind of with this narrative that individuals rise from harm immediately into like this bigger historical position and that it's oh look at this this historic thing that happened a person rose from harm mm. in a way that's unexpected and when I think the truth of it is at least in my own life is that I tend to try to sit with the pain sit with the hurt let it sit in my belly long enough that I can recycle it into something that is not only just going to be healing for myself but hopefully provide deep rutted pathways for other people to have a path out of their pain. And, and I see this, this movie, I see art in general as a way to do that, where people kind of encourage people for a little while to sit with the pain um, so that maybe it can be recycled into something else. And, and so I don't, I don't know that there's necessarily a question from that, but I just think that I want to lift up and affirm kind of the holy anger as, as Baird Rustin and MLK used to say, like that there is something churning in the anger. And even if you don't use it to be aggressive or to be, um, to repeat the harm on other people, but to still be able to name that the anger was a fuel or a catalyst mm. or a driver, that anger can be a driver for healing in the same way that anger can be a driver for harm. And, Absolutely. and there is something that maybe is a God moment in making a choice not to replicate harm back, right? And one of the things that I really appreciated about the film was that there's no, there's no like overarching narrative. There's no like James Earl Jones person in this film to like tell you how to believe at the end of it. It really is just building up empathy by listening to people's stories and but there are people in in the film who are in different timelines of their story maybe is the way to think about it so there are people who like for for lesbian gay and bisexual folk they maybe have been through a fuller arc of what conversion therapy may feel like for a majority of people who go through it and then in the film you're also following someone who is ex-trans identified who seems to be at an earlier stage of their timeline. And maybe they indeed are not a trans person, never were a trans person and were har harmed by that experience. We don't know because we're too, we're too early in the timeline. Like we yeah. don't know how the story ends yet. Right. We, just, we just see them where they are. And I think some of those harmful things that we did with with lesbian, gay, and bisexual folk are, is now being replicated. Even Absolutely. though we've decided it's abusive to do it to LGBT, to LGB folk, some folk haven't yet decided that it's harmful to do to trans folk. And transness is very complicated. All the decisions people make about their own bodies are complicated. All the ways people name themselves are complicated. And again, I err on the side of self-identifying with people where they are now, not where I imagine they might grow to later and so if somebody is ex-trans i believe they are ex-trans in the same way that if someone is is changing their pronouns i believe that they have changed their pronouns and so uh, it's it's just a thing i wanted to name for those who are watching the film that because we don't know what happens next in the stories of everyone featured it's basically a snapshot of a moment in time and, and of a complicated idea, but maybe, maybe um, 
the suggestion I think in the film is is that the we're at the we're at the beginning of what happened mm -hmm. with lesbian and gay folk, and it's starting again with trans folk, and we have the opportunity as faithful people to do a different thing this time. Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? A lot. <laughs> any that you want to share in a public forum that's being recorded? Sure. I mean, I think the way you just stated that is so poignant, and and represents how. You know, any of these issues are often politicized, and then the messaging that goes out around them is so inflammatory and high stakes. And you know, something that the film, you know, shows, even though it does not have that, you know, overarching voice telling you, is that there is an inextricable relationship between X LGBTQ uh, identities and testimonies and what anti-LGBTQ policy is ever attempting to do. And we just lose what you lifted up. And that is the nuance and the complexity of how we all relate to gender and how we all relate to sexuality and we all relate um, to any of the other, um, you know, social locations or cultural lineages that we come from. Uh, we are never one thing we are many things and and something that i i feel like i've reflected on to other people is when we look at uh, this protagonist who you mentioned you know describes themselves as x trans um it, it's a journey for them and they are figuring these things out and they are being as you know sincere as they can be in in their pursuit of what is true and what it means um, to live an authentic life. And um, for many people, gender is dynamic. It is fluid. You know, it is something that uh, changes throughout life. And who who knows? You know, what is next there? And and so the big kind of takeaway there is uh, is your story is your lived experience being weaponized? And I think if the answer is yes, then that should give us some pause. Um, and, and that is something we're seeing through this protagonist is that there are people who are using their story, exploiting it, mining it uh, to advance you know, particular you know, goals and holding it up as the standard you know for how all other um trans and gender expansive and gender diverse people should think about their lives um and and that is harmful and so that to me is that the, like let everybody have their story let everybody put into their own words like what they're experiencing and um let's take a step back and and be able to acknowledge how um how that story is being used and, and what's happening because it's being told the way it's being told. Yeah. And I think what I know from being a human being is that puberty is hard. Naming yourself is hard. Understanding how to articulate who you think you are at different stages of your life is hard. Um, Choosing when you accept titles that bring you into a community or out of a community is hard. Love is hard. Marriage is hard. Um, being faith communities is hard. And I'm, I'm grateful that at least in, in the Lutheran tradition, we have a God who's willing to take on flesh and go through puberty and go through name changes and go through um, all of the things that are hard, figuring out how to love, figuring out how to be faithful with very different opinions. In Jesus's day, there were a lot of people who thought he should follow a lot of rules and they thought they could have a say over what he did to his body. And so these are old conversations that we have not resolved. We might not resolve, um, but I am ever appreciative for folk who make it easier for us to kind of think about how we ought to live, how we ought to live faithfully and how we can maybe be better into the future. And so I am I am grateful for for Pray Away 
I hope that it's a useful tool for those who want to gain empathy um, or to make sense of the harm that they might have experienced from conversations around conversion therapy. And um, for those of you who are watching and, and, and what you were hoping for was to know that you are okay and that you are loved by God, I feel like I should just say that explicitly. Um, sorry, I waited this long to do it, but um, whoever you are, however you identify, wherever you are located, God loves you. It's not gonna change regardless of, of future choices or past choices or how you feel about yourself today. I hope you can grow in your love for God. I hope you can grow in your love for other people in your community. And I hope you can grow in ways that untangle the biases we have collected along the way. And um, so God does indeed love you and I love you. And I know that um, Miles is probably much better boundaries and waits to get to know people before declaring that you love them, but. <laughs> True. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> But I just I just wanted to say that in case there are people who the reason you came to this conversation was to say that. And so uh, thank you for your for your open conversation. There are lots of of comments in in um, what people have left lifted up about loving uh, the film, about loving um, this conversation and um, being really grateful that you have been able to be kind of so forthright and open and um, kind of the spirit which with, with you um, have brought into this conversation. So, so deep thanks to you um, and, and blessings on all that is ahead of you with this film. Let me know if there are ways that we can, can continue to support the film. Again, if you wanna go watch it or check out the links, um, we've put them in the links below. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. So nice to be here with you all. <laughs>